Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth technical session of the National Virtual Conference on Economic Dimensions in Judicial Decisions. This session is themed Teaching Economics to Law Students and Law to Economic Students in India. The new age caused by globalization had the base of social organization shifting from sociopolity to political economy. The new age in the newer social conditions demanded a revaluation of our thoughts and actions. From family management to protection of environment, from market regulations to constitutional governance, from social welfare to distributive justice. We reinvented reason, refined it in the cauldron of renewalism and optimized its use through the discipline of economics. Evaluating our thoughts and actions from the perspective of economic motivation exposed to some of the normative ethical fallacies of the past, primarily that reason was never free of passion. We realize the hard truth that we are egoistic per se. We realize that normative behavior is motivated by self-interest. Ethical dilemmas were coordination problems. Moral stances were in pursuit of payoff and that altruism was yet another form of ego. Beyond these behavioral revelations, we also understood the importance of optimizing thought and actions for efficient outcomes. The surge of economistic thinking had law evaluating every bit of its structure and function through the method economic analysis of law. Such analysis have helped us understand the effect of rules and the human behavior to such rules. In this national conference, economics features as a method and a domain and law as an objective analysis and the process of human self-becoming. This bone-crushing embrace of law and economics has its own discomforts, especially in reorienting law students to the need to understand economistic reasoning in opposition to the normative reasoning and economic students to understand the emergence of new spaces of imagination like law. This panel of the fifth technical session comprises of five distinguished colleagues who will discuss the opportunities and challenges of teaching economics to law students economics students. The panel comprises of uh, Professor Dr. Yugang Goyal, uh, Professor Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, Professor Dr. Divya Gupta, Assistant Professor and Assistant Dean, Jindal Global Law School, Professor Dr. Avishek Koner, Associate Professor, Jindal Global Law School, Professor Deepanshu Mohan, Associate Professor, Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. Today's moderator of the panel is Professor Dr. Ashita Dabur, Associate Professor, Jindal Global Law School. Over to you, Ashita. Thank you, Professor Srijit, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, I want to begin with highlighting the importance of interdisciplinarity. And uh, basically, we all understand that we live in an interdisciplinary world. For example, it will be quite a difficult task to separate economics from society and politics. Similarly, law and economics have also developed a very close relationship over the years. Whether it is tort law, contracts, or company law, or for that matter, even environmental law, all these subjects have their roots in economics. As we are in a globalized and liberalized world, we see the need to integrate various fields as this prepares the students to become better professionals and deal with upcoming challenges. Especially in today's world, when we are amidst a pandemic, and every day we see that there is increasing unemployment, migrant crisis, and oxygen shortages. The role of lawyers has become increasingly important in knocking the doors of the courts to ensure economic and health justice. To do so, lawyers do need an understanding of basic concepts of economics. This helps them comprehend the real economy and its challenges better. In the same breath, economic students need to grasp the nuances of legal policies, as these have direct impact on the functioning of the economy. For example, Fiscal Responsibility and Budgetary Management Act of 2003 mandates the fiscal deficit to be 3% of GDP. This is the reason for constant decline of fiscal deficit over the years, barring the pandemic year. Also, the new labor codes have increased the length of working days for workers, meaning further exploitation. Without understanding of these laws, economic students will not be able to decode these regulations and their impact on the economy. Economics has a considerable role to play in the analysis of legal issues. Expertise in law and economics enables lawyers to have an impact on a wide range of issues related to law, business, and finance, 
and also help economists to analyze the situation and make rules and regulations socially desirable. With the introduction of public finance, environmental economics, social choice theory, and regulation and antitrust law, the linkage between economics and law has gained more significance. Economic analysis of law proves to be a powerful framework for predicting the consequences of legal rules and for understanding when legal rules are warranted. It focuses on efficiency, incentive, and response of people's two incentives. In various parties' litigation, the tool of game theory is applied to answer pure legal questions. Thus, it is imperative to have an understanding of both these fields to become successful lawyers and economists. Incorporating both fields in the curriculum will lay the right foundation for future professions. With this, I'd like to open the floor for discussion. Uh, with, as Professor Shri has mentioned, we have Professor Goyal, Professor Mohan, Professor Panar, and Professor Gupta with us. First of all, uh, I would like Yugang and Devanshu to actually tell, tell us about what is the contribution of economics in developing of the legal system of a country. If any one of you can, like Yugang, you can go ahead first and then Devanshu. Okay. Or Devanshu first. All right, I'll, I'll do that. Well, I mean, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for, for organizing this. And I um, would like to first thank uh, each and everyone who is a member of the organizing team, uh, starting from Abhinav to uh, the vice chancellor and uh, everyone, I think, has been involved in, in, in organizing a conference in this you know, hour. It's a, it's a very difficult time and transition for a lot of people and what we are all grappling with. And uh, uh, I remember and I recall the Vice Chancellor mentioning this yesterday that universities have uh, a very important role to play and they have a larger responsibility towards um, the process of you know, knowledge creation and dissemination across uh, periods of time, no matter what it may be. We might be in a process of a crisis right now, but you know, going forward, we'll reflect back on what we did around this period of time. And some of us who are in a more privileged position uh, ought to uh, make uh, more more of, of of the time we have in hand. Um, just to respond to to Ashita's question, uh, the contribution of economics in in developing the legal system of a country uh, is, I would say, probably embedded in the the very classical roots of um, thinking in economics that evolved largely around if if one had to, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, go back to the work of Adam Smith or, you know, prior to that as well, uh, or even Kautilya for that matter, something that was very integral to the, the body of work produced uh, was in terms of gauging this, the, the nature of interaction between uh, what we consider today as the state and the market. Uh, state market integration or interaction was the way in which most discussion, uh, what we today call as political economy, uh, was central to the thinking of, 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 of classical thinkers. Uh, it was of a subject of interest to political philosophers. It was a subject of interest to sociologists. And um, later on, when we saw uh, the application of that evolving in a separate discipline, uh, that is of economics uh, independently, um, uh, a lot of the application uh, went about looking at how we can study uh, you know, the nature, form, structure of markets, largely as tools um, in organizing economic activity to, to make what Smith argued uh, as uh, uh, our own natural instincts to truck, barter, and exchange. A lot of these things were integral, I think, and skewed more towards the understanding of, of markets and what markets can do. And the idea may be, and this was uh, relevant in the context of the time we were living in, uh, or the human civilization wasn't at that period of time, uh, that is uh, an excessive command control of the state in the way in which we did everything um, uh, from kind of, you know, getting up, going to the market, what to buy, what to sell, uh, how to purchase, at what price to say, sell. I mean, everything had a very stored state, state control. And to detach away from that, there was a lot of discussion moving towards, you know, how markets can organize um, uh, economic activity better. Now, what happened in the process uh, was that we somehow 
uh, tried to uh, move away. And this happened largely with the neoclassical um, uh, advent, or I would say, uh, influence of, of, of the school of thought in economics. And when I'm talking about uh, a, a sort of a critique to, 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 to the way we look at economics uh, distance from law, I think a lot of that is uh, possible and, and available today because of um, the, the divide and the gulf uh, seen in this uh, from neoclassical thought. Considerations on redistribution, equity, welfare were very central to even classical economists as well. Smith uh, was very considerate about that. If you look at uh, before Wealth of the Nation, Theory of Moral Sentiments, um, Hume and his influence on, on, on Smith's uh, thinking, uh, many aspects that are interestingly a uh, part of a jurisprudential considerations um, in, in terms of principles of law were very integral to thinking around economics as well. Even the idea that Professor Sujit was mentioning around the idea of self-interest maximization is more of a 20th century uh, introduction in thinking uh, in Smith had in no way, if you look at even Wealth of Nations, uh, meaning or deluding to maximize one's self-interest while ignoring the well-being of others. Um, I mean, the moral sentiments sketches that out in, in more detail. Um, just to kind of look into the, the situation that we're in today, I think that's it's important. What is one of the central challenges that is affecting us, you know, as a civilization today? And I think the, the challenge itself has a, as a, as a question uh, which is connected with how both, you know, legal uh, stakeholders and economists uh, need to come together to be able to look at that uh, challenge. Uh, one is, of course, uh, we can look at climate change and others as part of many challenges that are there. But one of the challenges I feel is to be able to uh, see how technology and the pace of change that technological um, uh, pace, I mean, we, we're seeing that with the education sector right now in the midst of a pandemic, is changing and altering the way we, we process, absorb uh, new information, right? And how that affects the human, not just the human brain and human mind, but everything that human beings do. Because whether you look at uh, legal jurisprudence based on what you call as quote unquote, the reasonable person, um, or, you know, in new classical economics, the quote unquote rational man uh, or rational uh, person uh, for a more gender uh, sensitive approach, which many economists usually kind of kind of distance away from, uh, is uh, concerned with how rapidly technology is changing the way we do things. And I don't think that both in the legal uh, uh, vocation and also in economic thinking, there's a significant amount of attention being put. And I think that's, a, that's an area which can allow for a bridging force um, in looking at not just the role of institutions, uh, in the way in which we look at uh, considerations around the digital economy. Employment patterns are focused now mostly on the gig economy considerations. We don't no longer look and just the idea of what opportunity cost means. Uh, it's an attention economy we are grappling now with. There are signaling costs. Um, that are involved in the way in which you can hold each other's attention. And the entire dynamics of market is around catering to that attention and signaling cost itself. So everything that we study from government failure to market failure, um, uh, the role of uh, intellectual property rights, everything in the kind of a structure we're living in right now is based so embedded in strong technological adoption and absorption um, that the state market interaction, which is at the core of uh, economic thought, uh, ought to uh, you know, bring forth a more uh, convergence or a strong degree of convergence between thinkers uh, in the legal and the economic uh, diaspora. Well, um, thanks a lot. I, very quickly, I'm going to uh, put forth my thoughts in three layers. You see, um, you know, drawing from what the bunch you mentioned, um, essentially, allocation of resources in a society, um, you know, takes place through either hierarchy or through markets. Legal discipline largely has been driven to design allocations through hierarchy, because in markets, um, allocation by markets, the legal system has to become more of a facilitator or enabler. And so, as the state is receding from being its from from being the primary service provider to being a service facilitator, um, 
legal system. So you ask, what is it? What is the contribution of economics, right? To develop legal system, um, I think central because it's the legal system that creates framework that enable markets, uh, market-based allocation of resources, and that's what's happening. I mean, electric. So you know, electricity privatization is one such example. The second layer, uh, you know, um, in fact, uh, Srijit was talking about the bone-crushing embrace of uh, law and economics. Uh, I don't think there is any embrace going on, actually, frankly, uh, in India. Um, think about a framework, the second layer that I want to talk about. Think about the framework of right to property. Um, you know, we've been um, oscillating between it being a fundamental right and constitutional right, um, and how uh, various countries are debating about this aspect of right to property. It's, a, it's inherently an economic concept. Um, the, it ceases to be an economic concept if property is not valued monetarily. The moment it is, it is an economic concept. So right to property, um, which I would say is the cornerstone for development of uh, development slash growth, you can define them whichever way, of any society, um, is deeply embedded in, in, in economics framework. And so understanding right to property by lawyers um, will be inadequate if economic Im impetuses or economic variables that impact property rights um, are not laid out in a classroom, for instance. And then, of course, I can go on to mention about specific aspects like, uh, let's say, bankruptcy law. It is only now that we have an insolvency in bankruptcy code, um, which is central to development of a, of a legal system in an economy. Um, think about uh, public policy. Think about blockchain. Um, the point you were mentioning about technology. Um, regulation. I mean, we are, you know, I'm, um, um, I'm reminded of um, how little is economic thinking, um, you know, employed in understanding regulation. Uh, which is what we are seeing also. Uh, we are seeing it while the present pandemic is unfolding. Um, and, and, and so in so far as issues of public policy like we see in pandemic are important for legal system in the country, um, uh, economics is important for the legal system of the country. Um, ease of doing business, right? Uh, with, if, if ease of doing business is important for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, for, for constructing or creating an architecture for legal systems uh, in a country, then economics is important. I mean, the only five parameters in which now out of 10 parameters, we are scoring very high in five, very low in, in, in the other five. And one of the lowest score we get in enforcing of contracts, which is nothing but a legal entity. And that has to be understood through economic. I don't want to take more time, but uh, I think it is central. And I wish there was um, even, even an, an embrace to, you know, in the first place, let alone a bone crushing embrace uh, that I have. Thanks, Dipansha and Yutank. Uh, I think uh, we Mm -hmm. Two pertinent points mentioned by both of you, like one thing which Dipanshu mentioned about the distributive justice and one you mentioned about property rights. I think they are very important to because there needs to be an economic understanding of these concepts before you can actually only think of it only in the legal terms. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I will uh, now turn to Divya and uh, Abhishek. And um, I'd like to know your thoughts on higher, high secondary level education. Like, uh, should the concepts of law be a part of uh, the high secondary like education? Like there is science, you get to know a bit of commerce, a bit of humanities. There should, should there also be an engagement with a bit of law? Uh, Avishek, if you would like to go for first and... Uh, yeah, th thank you for that, but uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm competent uh, to answer what kind of law should be taught. I, I'm, my commonsensical answer would be yes. Um, but I, if, if I may, um, you know, like continue the discussion that um, uh, Dipanshu had started and sort of, um, you know, twist your question a little bit and make it into economics. That how is it that we are teaching economics, um, perhaps in school and but also in the university level. Um, and I, uh, many of the points that have been raised both by Dipanshu and Yugant um, are extremely important and thought-provoking. Um, Dipanshu reminds us something very crucial that is actually not known to the extent that I know um, majority of e economists do not talk about this, which is, um, which is that what is there in the classical tradition. People are often very quick uh, to, you know, invoke the name of Adam Smith and all of this. Uh, very few people have actually read it. It's not taught in classrooms uh, from what I know about this. Um, and uh, uh, there is a centrality of the... I, I'm going to pose it that uh, it's extremely important that 
we have some kind of economic thinking um, that is considered in both in legal education for lawyers and all of this, uh, but also that there is a need to rethink how economics is taught, uh, how the subject itself is taught to economists. Um, uh, and only then can we actually fully understand the, the gravity of the question that is posed to us. Um, as Ipancho reminded us that uh, what happened uh, in the late part of the 19th century and then it, it gained force in the, in the 20th century in the, uh, in the academic literature is that there is an understanding that in economics that you can comprehend economic questions, economic problems completely dissociated from, uh, from politics or society. So if you, if you go through an economics program, uh, people going in the, you know, uh, doing PhDs in uh, top 20, top 10 universities, um, they learn uh, cutting edge mathematical techniques. They are skilled at real analysis and linear algebra. They know almost nothing of sociology, uh, next to nothing of history. Uh, that is to say they are skilled at many, many things which have very little to do human, with, with human beings. Uh, this is not to say that mathematical things are unimportant or not useful, but this is to say that, you know, if we are, if we are skilled, like if I, if I, if I'm given a hammer, then everything is uh, nailed to me. Um, so a lot of the times the way economists actually approach things uh, is a very engineering mentality. That is, uh, it's a top down solution approach. Oh, this is a problem. We are going to build a bridge and the problem will be solved. Uh, that we have to design uh, best kind of policies and so on. I think that is rooted in an understanding. Um, I'm going to claim that this is a misconceived understanding of because social reality presents itself as a totality. As Ashita, when she was, uh, you know, introducing the the concept and all, um, she said that um, uh, yeah, that reality you know presents itself as a social totality. What we need uh, is to understand uh, social reality based on concepts and ideas which are social in nature and not uh, purely economistic. Uh, if you look at the uh, economic education, the way people uh, learn and it's taught to us, and often we are also guilty of teaching the same things, um, is you know you you conceive of a rational human being, rational in a very narrow, hyper-rational sense. The what some people have pejoratively called homo economicus, um, and uh, there is absolutely no discussion of of uh, politics and society. For us to have a meaningful understanding of how the legal structure is, uh, you know, how economic ideas are implicated, and how both of this, you know, talk to each other, I think economists need to have an understanding of that you cannot actually uh, talk of economic problems completely in isolation from social political. Just to give an example, if I, if I may pick up, uh, for example, the, uh, the things that have been said before, which is that the state and market interaction, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, if there is actually not much agreement, if you talk to economists, um, how they view the state. Uh, but if you go into a classroom or pick up a textbook, you might be you uh, you know one might be mistaken to believe that there is probably one right idea, and then you have opinions, different opinions. That's actually not the case. Uh, many, much of this is debated very hotly in the academic literature. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, what is the role of the state? The role of the state, if you ask a neoclassical economist, mainstream economist, they would simply say that not much. That is to say, the provision. Uh, of allocation of resources, it has to be done simply by uh, market forces, and the role of the state is only to uh, ensure that markets are in place uh, and they are functioning well. And there are some occasions where uh, you have market failure. We have to either create markets or there has to be some kind of state provisioning, but that has to be minimal. If you ask someone who believes uh, who is a Keynesian, they would have a completely different understanding of what the state is. They would say. Uh, that the uh, if you leave markets on their own, they would not lead to a situation of uh, you know a very happy situation. That is to say, Keynes would show that there are occasions when you have uh, an equilibrium with a lot of unemployment, low output, low income. These things can be result of market equilibrium. So therefore, the state's role is to actually uh, make sure that output is boosted in times of low demand and so on. 
if you look at it from a classical political uh, perspective, uh, that of Smith or if Marx, uh, who is a classical political economist, much in the tradition of Smith and Ricardo, it's a completely different understanding where uh, you, you think of society as uh, composed of social classes. You have landowners, you have capitalists, you have workers, and uh, the state has to mediate the role of different classes. Um, so the, the point is that I think it's a extremely topical and sadly it's a, it's a very hard question. Um, if we really need to honestly sort of grapple with this question, uh, we also have to, as economists, uh, sort of rethink some of the way the subject is learned, taught, um, and thought of. Um, uh, yeah. Um, thank you, Abhishek, for such great insights on the, first of all, introspection, the need for introspection among economists to reimagine the way we are teaching economics and the reimagine the curriculum of economics, not just at the a higher education level, but right from the school education level. Um, I would like to very briefly respond uh, and try to address the question that Ashita has posed that what is the need and how, is there a need to introduce law or education of law uh, in the school curriculum at the school level? I believe that there is, it's going to, it's, it's, if, if it does happen, it's a great step actually, that if law can be, or the education of law, the legal processes and legal systems can be introduced uh, can be integrated integrated into our uh, school curriculum uh, because currently the education system our education system is such that it is considered most appropriate the education of law is considered most appropriate only at the higher education level and that too primarily uh, professionally there is no emphasis at the school level on the need for the understanding of the legal processes and legal systems or it's just simply the basic ideas of justice equality liberty etc uh, in US, for example, a large number of schooling systems have introduced the basic education of law, legal processes integrated into their school curriculum. So there is a need for us also to adapt, to adopt a similar uh, kind of an uh, integrated school curriculum, which fits well into our sociocultural setting. Now, when we talk about introducing law into the school curriculum, it is really important to set out the goals very clearly, the goals and the objectives of a, such a curriculum very clearly. The idea should not be, the goal of uh, such a curriculum would not be to uh, produce amateur lawyers out of our elementary and secondary level students, right? Uh, because the goals and the pedagogy at the, of the school level education is very different from the higher education, uh, 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 the, the objective of a higher education system. So here, when we talk about uh, uh, introducing law or integrating law into the school curriculum, the objective should be to confront the students with the basic ideas of justice and uh, e uh, equity and uh, fairness for that matter. And it should be to uh, inculcate and incorporate an alternative approach to examining issues of timeless concerns to human beings, like those of, you know, again, I'm uh, stressing the need to understand and to incorporate alternative approaches to understanding these uh, timeless issues that human beings have been facing, like those of property, power, uh, uh, inequality, justice, etc. And I'm not saying that uh, these ideas have not been looked at or are not being looked at already uh, as a part of your, our school curriculum. The perspectives that we are providing to our students to such ideas is through history, economics, political science, but definitely, but definitely not from the perspective of law. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, integration of the study of the legal processes into our school curriculum uh, has to be not as an isolated course not like a classic legal education course. It has, it can probably be incorporated right from kindergarten to the high school level. And uh, uh, so far as the, the, the separation of the streams is concerned, I don't feel uh, 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 it necessarily has to be as a separate stream in addition to what we already have, like sciences, commerce, and humanities. Uh, and more so because with the new education policy of 2020, the, this archaic watertight separation uh, uh, between these streams and the freedom for the students to choose, choose from uh, uh, these streams is anyway going to ease out. So it should really be very integrated into the entire curriculum and not really be introduced as just a course 
a classic course of legal education at the higher secondary level. It has to be really a part of the uh, uh, pedagogy of the school education right from the kindergarten probably until the high school level, until the higher secondary schooling level. Yeah, that's what my thoughts are. Thank you. I think uh, Dipanshu wants to add something and I welcome him. Very quickly, when we say, uh, you know, introducing legal um, uh, provisions of education at the level of curricular, you know, maybe secondary, higher secondary or high school. Uh, see, we live also in a country where there are three versions, you know, of, of societal landscape, uh, where the, 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 the demonstrated value of education means very different to different sections. And, uh, you know, if you imagine someone who is uh, coming from predominantly a farming community and maybe interested in continuing, let's say, in the business of farming, I'm talking about someone who's interested, not many are, uh, but those who are, or maybe, uh, you would want them to be educated about where and how the new farm laws have come in and how does it affect uh, your own ability to, to work. Um, if you ask from a general pers perspective, because I personally feel that a universalist approach uh, to uh, educating and deciding what should be in the curriculum and what should not be, I think is not maybe the more ideal way of going forward. I think we've made that as a mistake in our education system quite chronically and as a structural uh, issue. Um, uh, but there are certain aspects which you want everyone to be aware of. And I, I argued earlier this in a long column about the, the value of constitutional uh, morality, making that as a yardstick for, um, you know, introduction in education for, for people in understanding what the, what the values of the constitution want to impart. Uh, I remember going, educating, educated in a Catholic school. Um, and those uh, who may have got access on, on having this course called the Moral Science, which was with us for, for a very long period of time. Uh, what if, the, I mean, just I'm just saying, you had a course on constitutional uh, or public law provisions on human rights, um, on, on discussions which can make, uh, as, a, as a student, uh, someone more sensitive to the socio-legal uh, considerations of a, a, a certain spatial dimension. So I think beyond looking at what Yuvanga mentioned about uh, integration of uh, financial uh, law, or bankruptcy court, uh, contract law, uh, and a number of those aspects which are very important from a vocational perspective to given, uh, you know, people across different ways. Um, there is a case to be made in terms of making uh, constitutional public legal education more accessible at a more decentralized and lower, lower, lower level. Uh, at the same time, for, for, for those interested in law, I think what we do is most of the time focus too much on very basic elements of economic thinking, microeconomics, macroeconomics, uh, statistics, econometrics out of nowhere. And we try to coercively introduce uh, some of these things and add to from a very distant, narrow neoclassical prism uh, to, a, to a set of students who are not interested in that abstract reality uh, and that process of uh, mathematical uh, formalism, which is so integral to, to the way neoclassical economics has evolved. Um, it's difficult to explain. And I think that's the next set of questions maybe that Ashita had shared with us about how to make pedagogically some of these things accessible. So I'll offer you. Thank you. Uh I think this was a very interesting insight. Like what I gained from all of you is this, that essentially it's not only about introduction of law into the curriculum. It's about connecting it to the reality uh, and imparting education, which is actually going to make some, give you some kind of morality and understanding of things rather than just a black letter law. So, Similar to something what uh, Avishek and Dipanshu were also mentioning in terms of uh, the way economics is taught, uh, whether it's at the elementary level, school level, or at the mm, bachelor's level, or further on, micro, macro, econometrics, and all this is just imposed on us without connecting it to reality. So, um, similar to this, this question, I will uh, want 
all of you to answer, but be, please be brief about it because we have limitation of time. There is this uh, curiosity, which I also have, that what kind of uh, challenges do you face when you teach economics to law students? Hmm. So, and I'm sure all four of us, uh, like five of us, including me, uh, we all go through these challenges. So I'm just curious to know all your experiences that what happens and uh, how can we actually inculcate the thinking of economics, especially linking it to reality in these law students. So um, I think I'll begin with Divya and uh, then Yogang, Yavishek and Dipanshu. Thank you, Ashita, for this question. Um, uh, in my limited experience of uh, teaching economics to law students so far, so one of the very basic uh, important challenges that I have faced uh, in my uh, experience of teaching economics to law students is the fear of math, fear of uh, that math phobia, that uh, uh, that discomfort that many law students, most law students have with maths. So I believe that many law stu many students who when they enter a law program the the expectation their expectation is that whatever math or whatever algebra or calculus that they had to do they were done with until their school level and now they won't have to see even a single equation. So when I talk about math, I'm not saying basic discomfort with uh, doing simple additions or subtractions, but just those complicated looking equations that first order differentiation and that kind of mathematics is what I'm talking about. Now, the problem is that when we uh, teach the basic models of uh, microeconomics or macroeconomic, the introductory level, even at the introductory level economics that we teach to law students, uh, the basic models also involve use of some some math right so the challenge so there then there is this challenge and the process that goes into trying and simplifying or to an extent limit the use of math without compromising the crux and the uh, main ideas of the models that we are teaching them without compromising the implications of the model and that should actually be the way uh, the introductory level economics or these models should be taught to the law students. And imp another important uh, thing that needs to be incorporated in our pedagogy of teaching economics to law students is to teach them applications of those models which are relevant for them. Most of the times, a lot of times, they are not able to link what we are teaching them. They are uh, not able to link these basic models, uh, uh, the simple market model of demand and supply. They're not able to link it not just with the reality, but also why and how it is relevant. Why is it important for them to learn these models? So we have to be able to uh, sort of uh, make this connection so that they are better motivated to study and to uh, 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 take this course rather than just to fulfill their credit requirements. The second thing is, is uh, at a broader level, the second challenge is, is at a broader level, which is difference in the approaches or difference in the ways of thinking. So most of the times, uh, most economists, in economics, we are not usually predicting or uh, uh, considering all the relevant variables at the same time. We are holding a lot of variables constant and concentrating on the uh, importance and trying to uh, understand the implication of one particular variable. But this is not the way lawyers are trained to be thinking. This is not the way law students are supposed to be thinking if they're trained to be lawyers. They have to have a holistic view of the problem at hand. They have to take into consideration all relevant, all confounding variables at the same time. For They cannot reject one variable. Uh, they cannot pay more attention to one variable at the cost of the other. So this is that discipline, the uh, disciplinary limitation of economics that we have to, I have had to deal with uh, while trying to relate uh, economics, the basics of the economics to law students. And I'm looking actually forward to the experience of other uh, panelists. Uh, yeah. No, I agree with you, Divya, uh, entirely. Um, let me add uh, my two pence here. Um, I think one of the reasons, uh, one of the problems that I've found um, um, in this context is the, the very nature of how instrumentally students take education. And so if law students know, um, or if there is a dominant perception that, uh, you know, economics is just a subject that you have to pass. The bunch who mentioned about moral science, this was the dominant perception of moral science back in our schools, right? You just have to pass it. If, if that is the perception, 
um, then, um, and this perception largely is driven through discourses within the universities, not outside, right? Um, so, uh, so for as long as this perception ex it just um, exists, it uh, it will lead to uh, a scenario where students will be relatively less receptive to this discipline, um, uh, whether with maths or without. Of course, math also has its own problems. The other problem is that the standard textbooks to, um, of Economics 101, let's say, are generally um, written or designed um, you know, for economics audience, not for legal audience, which means there is a problem inherently in the way in which economics is uh, transmitted, so to speak, right, to law students. And so therefore, um, for instance, uh, like Vivya mentioned, um, considerable part of economic thinking um, that comes out of textbook, and most of these textbooks are written by Western economists, and so they have absolutely, I mean, very little relevance. I mean, uh, price is not discovered using demand and supply all the time. I mean, only in competitive markets. And competitive markets are hardly existing. And so in some sense, students are unable to access their own experience through this. And so one of the things that is important um, is that economics, when it is taught to students in law, um, you know, law students, um, it has to be taught uh, meaningfully for legal, uh, for a legal mind, or for legal thinking, or, or a mind that is already fertile for legal thinking. So, in, so instead of picking up topics, from um, standardized textbooks, um, it would be better if economists um, engage with, quote, with with topics that relate. Um, that sort of. So I'll, I'll give an example. Um, you know, prices as signals. Um, I remember last year when COVID, and you know, it's an opportune moment to talk about it. When COVID struck, uh, prices of masks and sanitizers went shot through the roof, right? Um, and the 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 response of the legal response of the district magistrates and policemen around was to, uh, you know, go against the black market teams, right? So they announced, I know many cities, if the chemist or the drugstore is found to be selling masks at higher price, they will uh, take away the license of the drug owner. Now, the problem why masks became expensive is because the raw material prices became expensive because the supply is inelastic. Um, you know, you need uh, different kinds of adhesives, glue, uh, cloth, elastics to be able to make a mask. Because now people need it suddenly a lot more, and the supply cannot be provided suddenly, the prices of raw materials also rose. And so, you know what ended up happening? Um, drug stores and chemists started, uh, stopped selling masks because they were fearful that the police is going to impound their, their space. Now, this is, an in, this is an interesting example that lends cred credibility to the idea. So legal thinking, um, think about regulation for that matter. We must teach externality. In order to understand environment or law related to environment, external, concepts of externality could be highly enriching for students. Um, I mean, I don't even want to get into competition law cases and bankruptcy cases, which of course require economic thinking. Um, but an extremely important aspect that economics teaches law students and which should be brought, brought in um, um, is, is the idea of how static and dynamic views of the world is different. Static efficiency and dynamic efficiency is different. Short run or a present view of the world is different from the long run view, um, you know, view of the world. When you, um, you know, when you look at the telecom cases, the 2G case, or the or the Vodafone case recently. I mean, each of these cases had a very high level of significance for how the te telecom sector in India is going to unfold over time. And so the, the judgments or the policies that are drafted at the level of government in a very, very legalistic thinking, you know, in, in, in a manner of very legalistic thinking, often fail to recognize the long-term implication of taking these decisions. Now, it, so, so these conversations have to be brought into the classroom. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is one of the difficulties is that conversations generally emit, coming out of economics discourses may not necessarily be relatable to, um, to a law student. Um, and in that sense, uh, I would not really, I mean, even though uh, I would really blame the way in which we look at education instrumentally for this, uh, but I think there is there needs to be a culture where um, legal thinking devoid of economics um, what kind of uh, what kind of massive costs um, it imposes? I, 2017 Supreme Court case, Shiv Shakti Sagar sugar case, right? So here's a law, and you know only India can have laws like this, where a sugarcane mill cannot be set up close to another sugarcane mill as long as the distance is more than 15 meters. So new sugarcane mill has to come about 15 kilometers. So you can only set up a sugarcane mill beside a sugarcane mill if you're away 50, 15 kilometers from, from the other mill. Now, um, now this is an interesting law. I mean, you know, we have laws about uh, alcohol shops outside universities, right? Certain, certain meters 
you cannot have uh, cigarette and alcohol being sold outside university and public education spaces. Um, or for that matter, Supreme Court judgment where they they announced that uh, you know public highways, um, you know the alcohol shop should be 50 meters. I mean, all of these cases, um, you know, have huge impact um, in livelihood of poor people. And um, and this this goes for for, for instance, uh, you know, licenses. Um, if you restrict licenses for rickshaw pullers, they're only going to end up paying bribes to police officers or for street vendors. So we are talking about economics, not not being so lack of economic thinking impacting one of the most vulnerable population um, of the society. And part of this comes because of the lack of reception or there's some sort of a barrier to understanding this within the classroom. And this needs to go by the type of discourse that emerges within the university spaces that economics is not just a subject that lawyers have to study, you know, a certain, a certain period of time and, uh, you know, once a week. Um, it is embedded within across, uh, across all disciplines. And I'm not even going into tax right now, um, you know. Um, in fact, in Shiv Shakti Shagar Sugar case, uh, the Supreme Court mentioned um, that economic thinking is essential um, for taking decisions uh, which have long-term implications that often lawyers face. I'm sorry, I'm, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for, for, for now. Uh, Avishek, uh, since you're going to tell us about the challenges that you face when you teach law students, I mean, it will be more interesting if you can also tell us from the perspective of the political economy that you teach, uh, the subject that you teach. I mean, that would be, uh, that would actually give a good highlight to our discussion, but please be brief about it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um... So, you know, th there are two aspects to this and one aspect has been uh, very, uh, it's been highlighted very well, uh, very articulately, both by Divya and Yugang, which is that there is a, there is a difficulty of teaching economics, uh, you know, to law students, difficulty with textbooks and mathematical formalism. There is another aspect, which is, which is the, uh, which is, I've actually found that there are certain things, uh, it's easier to, to, to teach law students or at least I found a greater amount of uh, receptivity from coming from law students, which is that uh, often I've approached that, okay, how am I going to teach economics? Um, I will try to teach it as a, uh, as um, a lay person would, I'm not, I'm not teaching someone who is going to be a practitioner. Uh, and so in do, doing this, of course, you have to teach a little bit of the, uh, the, the models and, uh, in the curricula. But then you bring in criticisms, which is to say that the the exact cases of the things that have been mentioned by Divya, which is that you know perfect competition or uh, this thing, uh, and when you make an argument that look, uh, some of these models have actually these are mathematical models which have been set up uh, to actually buttress a political point. That is to say, these theories come to the fore in a particular kind of time, uh, and it basically shows that you know, the, we are living in a society which is largely conflict-free uh, and the markets as a social institution uh, manage uh, and there should not be much dissatisfaction. Consumers come of their own volition, producers come of their own volition, they meet in the market. The result is amazing because you get the maximum happiness for the consumer and all of this, um, uh, you know, the, the remuneration that you're getting is according to what economists call marginal product or in the lay terms, that is to say, you are being remunerated according to the contribution that you make. So therefore, this this kind of analysis rules out conflict. <laughs> it's actually have it, it buttresses a certain kind of ideological uh, position and uh, political position. When I make these kinds of arguments, and I also teach political economy as an elective, uh, where of course I'm going to have much more uh, elaborate discussions uh, through the semester, I've actually found. Uh, students to be much more receptive. They are, uh, they appreciate it very much. Um, uh, I think that they are more open because there is no disciplinary sort of anxiety or, you know, there is an in-group, out-group loyalty. When you speak to economists, they feel like they have to defend, oh no, but how can you say this about perfect competition? There is a defense mechanism kicks in. Uh, sometimes it happens with students who associate it, like, you know, they are economic students and they feel like they need to defend something that they are good at, you know, they, they are doing well in their classes. Um, you see. Uh, that is actually absent. And in my experience, that's been, that's been a positive feature. Um, I have seen quite surprisingly, actually, to, to my surprise, uh, I didn't expect this when I joined, 
a uh, lot of colleagues are open to these conversations uh they they are open to sort of redesign curricula introduce different kinds of topics and all of this which is typically not the experience uh in other economics departments all the ones that i am familiar with uh and students are also receptive so uh, just the other side of the uh the picture i suppose yeah i mean just very quickly i know we we short of time but i i'll actually agree with um, uh abhishek here in my own experience actually i haven't faced any problem or or serious challenge in teaching a uh, basics of a micro or macro economics if you're talking about basics here because if you go into courses like i mean yugang teaches a course in institutional economics uh, i've been taking development economics this time so though those are different domains i mean when you go into domains that's a different thing but i'm talking basic courses if you're taking that as a i haven't faced actually uh, much of a challenge it's also about your own journey as a teacher last 8 to 9 years uh, that i've been teaching i've never taught a core uh, econ cohort uh, in india uh, the challenge that i face is when i teach a course uh, to university abroad over the summer Uh, in north america uh, which is taught to a third or fourth year undergraduate uh, scored and it's there where i start kind of seeing that uh, what avishek started with talking about you're so embedded and entrenched in a certain way in which economics is learned and taught that the expectation is and it's very interesting when i go into the classes there's a chalk and a board and there's almost a space for equations and explanations already put out there Uh, a teaching assistant of mine would already always do that you know before you go into the class and i said well i i don't use that uh, not that i have anything against uh, the use of math- uh, mathematics as against music or anything it's a language of communication i have uh, tried always in the way i teach almost all classes is to come up with three uh, narratives or three stories uh, that i want uh, to use as a way of teaching a particular concept i think you can't has done that very eloquently here to talk about case laws by introducing and one of the reasons could be that uh, your own journey maybe as a teacher was influenced largely by teaching law students at jindal at the very initial stage where we had to make that adjustments very quickly you see and i think that's why have being in an institution like jindal and i'll i always compliment and be very grateful for that degree of exposure here because i have taught from a student of art and architecture to a student of banking and finance to a student of liberal arts uh, to a student of international affairs everyone is in the same room now how to make sense to them uh, i think the only way i feel is that what really moves us as human beings individuals are stories and narratives so once i kind of bring a sense of visual imagery and and, and a narrative or a story to explain a particular concept as against a mathematical i mean both are their own words of abstract reality right a fictional novel or a mathematical model to a student actually both are aliens uh, it's just that there is a phobia against one as against a lesser of a phobia against the other right so uh, i think that the use of narratives use of stories is a very powerful pedagogical technique uh, the other very quick point is in the first Three to four weeks when you're setting the tone for the course, the use of philosophy and history in introducing the discipline uh, and its value to a student is a very important process. I consider this as uh, in Avatar, you have this relationship between the warrior and the horse. For that to happen, their tails had to meet. You remember? I don't know. Uh, there was this. I consider that that as a stage that there has a bonding. you need to make in the first 3 4 weeks so if i get like the first 3 4 weeks with the students i'm not doing anything which has to do with introduction to marginal cost or uh, you know marginal cost just ideas that why as a discipline uh, one needs to be interested so the philosophy behind it the history and once you have uh, then you 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 say that okay there are few classes i'm going to take which is going to be hard swill to i mean pill to swallow uh i would be using certain vocation but i want you to be with me you know i want you to hold uh and be in this process together so a lot of times when i'm even teaching equation i'm purposefully making errors while 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 talking about it so that there is some degree of attention that a student is 
having, and they can correct me. Oh, sir, you're actually wrong. Oh, really? Uh, is that so? And I look at the textbook. I, I've done so many role plays as a way to kind of get and see because it's about attention. Once you get a student's attention, in fact, for that one hour, and and use certain ways of you know theatricality or whatever you may call it, uh, you've got them right. And and then the, the more difficult topics that you know for a fact it's going to be difficult for a student to follow, you can help them go through that. So it's a very um, I think it's a very different experience. Every day is a new day. But that's the way I would uh, like to put it. Thanks, all of you. Actually, we are short of time, though, despite the fact that I really wanted to ask you a lot of other questions as well. I think what I'm going to ask you towards the end is this, and I'll request you to keep your answers like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we better integrate the effect of laws in day-to-day -day lives of people who study economics? I hope the question is clear. Uh, so, okay. How can we better integrate the effect of laws in day-to-day -day lives of people who study economics? So, something like farm laws, for example. Uh, so, I think now I'll begin with you, Gang. Go on to... Well, when you said uh, keep, when you said keep your answers uh, short and until thirty seconds, uh, that's when you really behave like an economist. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I can't help it. I am under the deadline. That's good. That's good. I I I, I like it. Anyway, so very quick answer. I think um, students or um, anyone who considers himself or herself a student and who is interested to understand law, they should go into the field. Um, we know that. Understanding, comprehending how India operates under the shadow of law is different from how a Western European country would. And therefore, education, educating Indians' legal system, educating Indians' law uh, should not be a mimicry of educating an Englishman about law or German about law or Australian about law. And in that sense, um, I mean, we, we know, and there is no two way about it, we don't follow law as much as we follow norms. And in order to understand norms, people have to go out. So the best way to do it is to send students and go fetch their driving license. Let them try to get a license to a rickshaw puller. Let them try to go and file their own taxes. Let them actually try um, and set up a shop just for the sake of it um, and see how law engages, interplays, continuously pushes them to navigate their spaces around its system, regardless of what is written on the paper because that's really what matters. Of course, what's written in the paper is going to come out. Um, get them to sit in the court and listen to the judges, good and bad both, what, whatever type of judgments. This experiential learning is really what teaches in law. We tell them that legal, you know, you study law by reading what is written in a statute only to realize much later, the world is very different. And this is what actually makes, uh, you know, law, uh, I mean, um, so, so we have to look at law as an art rather than a science. And I, I know this might be a controversial statement for many, but, but anyway. This is, this is important. I am so glad that you mentioned this because uh, experiential learning is one. The other is that there is a huge emphasis that needs to be and ought to be made on clinical legal education as a tool for amassing all other shows. I always feel sociology, history, philosophy, they are the bridges between the gaps between law and economics. And the way you amalgamate these is to put everyone out in the domain. But you can't do it if you have 60, 70 students in the class. You say uh, you can do it when you have 20, 25, or 30 students to work around with. Because experiential learning and that process of exposure uh, is something you can do it in batches. So I think there has to be a mechanism in a pedagogical discussion. I'm quite sure Sujit and uh, in, the, in the institutional mechanism of discussing uh, need to need to look at this. So I think experiential learning is very important. That's 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 the way you will you'll introduce not its laws, but just the thinking of exposure to looking at other uh, ways of thinking. Because what is interest of interest to you, Ashita and me and you know Yugang may not be of interest to a student. Most of them they want to go into commercial practice in an elite uh, case uh, of of education. But once you expose them to a little bit of a of a background, you might find that litigation. Maybe of, of interest as well, and right, and that's that's something we want to encourage. Quickly, Avishek and Devya, your thoughts. Uh, yeah, uh, most of the important points have been made. So, 
Uh, just uh, briefly, I would say that um, the examples that you picked up, which is that of agricultural uh, laws or the labor laws, I would say, um, in fact, I've done this in class and people, resp students respond very uh, positively to this, which is that to look at the historical trajectory and understand this in a political economic context, that you cannot understand this uh, without understanding that there is an agrarian crisis. And if you know that there is an agrarian crisis, depending on the political context and the balance of class forces, uh, you have a certain kind of political ideas and uh, dispositions who are more powerful. So this you can imagine is a right wing response to the to a crisis which exists. Um, and when I, of course, you have to flesh it out. But when you make this basic point, it's a uh, lot of students. It, it seems to make sense. Same with the agricultural laws. Uh, sorry, the in the, uh, the labor laws, which is that you have uh, declining growth rates, you have stagnation. This is in the advanced world. Also, you have uh, the precipitous was in the 2008 missing uh, for us in India. It's I think after 2012 onwards, uh, it's hard to solve the problem uh, because it's a problem of capital accumulation, which which the economy is facing. So then, how do you uh, this thing? Well, it's it's one of the right wing response that the state has uh, to this problem. So yeah, I've, I already exceeded my 30 seconds. So, yeah. So I'll probably stick to less than 30 seconds because most of what I wanted to say has already been said. Very specific, very great examples have already been uh, uh, spoken by all three um, panelists. So I'm just going to uh, uh, suggest a very different and a rather more long-term approach to uh, include law and legal processes as a part of our day-to-day lives. It has to really start from the schooling system. It has to be incorporated into the entire education system and not just as a professional degree at the higher education level. And that's how we will start really incorporating the basic ideas of the legal processes and legal systems in our day to day life. So that's it. That's all I want. Thank you, everyone. These ha this has been a very interesting discussion. In fact, the takeaway for me personally has been that uh, you cannot guess in the uh, pursuit of teaching economics and law, we have to teach these two subjects, but we should not uh, make an attempt to disintegrate them with philosophy, history, or sociology. We rather need to integrate all these fields to have a better understanding or a holistic understanding of law and economics together. So I will now give the mic to Srijit. Uh, and thank you. Srijit, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues, for that extremely informative and insightful session. Uh, there was the absence of a lawyer in the panel. Uh, by lawyer, I mean somebody born and brought up in a law school, uh, uh, not really members with advanced degrees in law. But obviously, the central idea of the panel was uh, for the law to become a subject matter of your conversation. Hence, the panel is constituted in this way. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone connected to us through JGU's YouTube channel. Our next session, Economic Analysis in Public Health and Environment, will commence at 1.45 p.m. Please stay connected or tune in in the next few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.